for being here. Um, let me turn it over to Kenneth, Brother Kenneth, to uh, introduce our speaker today. Well, uh, Chinese is like family to me. Um, you'll hear a common theme with me as we had with uh, Christy Finner. Um, I met her through my wife. <laughs> um, actually, I, I guess we attended church together years past, and we, I guess, passed one another, but didn't really know one another. Um, but I got to know her through my wife uh, in my wife's yoga studio. She's been a tremendous supporter of my wife, um, of Shabbat Yoga, and has been a teacher there and a facilitator and just all kinds of things there. And she's well credentialed and she's um, she's rooted in the Lord. And I thought that she would when Aaron, you know, uh, brother Aaron asked me, you know, for a referral. I immediately thought about her and I asked my wife and she was like, absolutely. So, um, you know, again, she's well credentialed and again, she's rooted in the Lord. So. Um, again, thank you, Trinace, for taking the time out of your day to come and just share with us and just impart your wisdom and your knowledge. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, take it away. All right. Well, I appreciate both of you, Aaron and um, Kenneth. This is gracious of you, first of all, to think of me and then for the gracious introduction. And we are indeed family. Uh, I do uh, consider you and your wife um, family. And so it was an honor to uh, to be asked to do this and looking forward to this time with you all. Um, who knows, maybe I'll give you some time back, but my goal is to make this really fruitful for us um, and to hope that you would gain a whole lot from it and that I'll keep you awake um, maybe for uh, for Helen, maybe uh, prolong the need for the <laughs> for, for the medication. We'll see um, how long we can keep you. Um, it is a pleasure to be here to talk about this topic, and um, I'm just going to go ahead to uh, this slide because, um, as has been said um, by Kenneth, I I am immersed in um, not just ministry but also the marketplace. I do a lot of work. Um, in leadership development. I was just sharing with Aaron that uh, I am a regular consultant for colleges and universities, um, civic organizations, um, Jack and Jill, the Lynx, uh, the American Council on Education, uh, uh, just to name a few. And, um, and I'm also an uh, interim associate vice president of human resources at the College of Southern Maryland. Um, I've, my doctorate is literally in higher education administration, and the theme was leadership development. Um, and, um, and so I've done full-time ministry and, um, and ha have a, a, a MDiv at Howard University. And so I think we'll be able to talk from all of the lens as it relates to leadership. I will warn you in advance, um, this will not be your typical leadership um, <laughs> conversation. Uh, I think you'll see that as we move forward. I have all of the theories. I have all of the study behind it. Um, but in A, my effort not to make this boring, and, and B, <laughs> in my effort to be as practical and useful as possible, we're really going, going to dig into this in some very practical ways. And so as a result, we're going to talk about, because you mentioned both, um, my antennae went up and loved the opportunity to talk about managers and leaders not just the difference between the two, but the connections between the two, as you'll see in just a moment. Uh, we'll talk about leading with soul, which is a framework I developed. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think we're going to end up talking about um, this leadership in a very different way. And then several ways to be a better leader or manager. And like I said, I love the practicality of that conversation. And you are going to be active in this conversation, hopefully in the chat, hopefully unmuting. Um, this will not just be me talking for the next hour and some change. So I'm hopeful that you'll look forward to that as well. I do have my chat window up and my participants window up so that I can see when you unmute. Um, if you're ready to share at any point, I will welcome it at some points, but and I will acknowledge what's happening in the chat. But um, feel free to just say something to me out loud because I'm putting your faces away uh, just so that I can see more of the screen. Uh, but feel free to say something to me out loud if there are any Zoom issues uh, in addition to if you just want to share. 
Starting with the difference between leaders and managers, um, I just want to start there because, like I said, I do know that there are some clear distinctions, um, but I think that they are so connected. So I thought I'd start with this being our premise that leaders and managers share some essential characteristics and some dissimilarities. So while leadership is about building a vision for people to follow, um, leaders are definitely visionaries. Management is also looking after the day-to-day -day operations. And I know sometimes we have a tippy top person and then we have some deputy officer um, who is in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. But you'll see um, as we move forward, in my opinion, uh, that that manager is also a leader. <laughs> and that leader, if they are a good visionary and they are setting the tone and the stage for everyone else, they have to manage well. Um, secondly, the role of management is to control a group or a group of individuals. And I know that's a, a different type of word to use in a church setting, but the idea of being able to manage is to um, hone in, rein in the objective, what we are trying to achieve and move us forward um, in that. And so that's the role of management, really moving us together toward an, a, a specified objective. I think about shepherds, right? Just really trying to move all of these flock in one direction. That's definitely management. I think that's also leadership, right? Uh, but, but to distinguish them just a bit, leadership is the ability of an individual to influence, motivate, and enable others to contribute to the organization's success. So what I love about this second bullet is when you are managing, you have the objective in mind and you are moving people toward it. Leadership is, is helping people want to move <laughs> toward the objective that you set. So how do we me mesh the two, right? How do we move people? Because you don't always have um, an objective that everybody understands or that everybody wants to move toward. But I think the, the clear distinction is also the connection that we want to make. We good managers are, are leaders in that, the best managers, I'll say it that way, are, are leaders in that they have objectives and they're able to influence, motivate, and enable others to want to move toward that objective. Um, leaders, the best leaders are good managers because they're clear about their objectives. They're not living in la-la land just with a vision and no idea about how to get there. So uh, I just want your quick take on this um, before we move forward. That in, in just a, a nutshell, have I, have I done in two seconds a good job of, of my supposition that the best leaders are good managers and the best managers are good leaders? Anything in the chat or does anybody want to unmute to share what your thoughts are just in the role that you sit in or um, in what you observe in your church churches or your organizations? Any thoughts verbally? Yes, uh, this is Kenneth. I'll go, I'll go ahead and begin. Um, as I just put in the chat, you have to, we, we I think on, in this particular uh, group here have to be one in the same. Um, I mean, because of the fact that we kind of have to be visionaries in essence, for the administrative aspect of things to support the ministry, but yet you also have to receive that vision from the pastor as well. Um, and, and kind of leading, you know, if you will, for the pastor, a lot of the pastor to continue to pastor, mm -hmm. you know, so that you kind of take some of that burden off of their shoulders. Such a good, good insight. I, when I think about the role that you all play, um, after you have taken the vision from the pastor for the church at large, you then have to hone that into what does that mean for the day-to-day -day operations of the church. So in essence, you are crystallizing what the pastor passes on to you as a leader of your area and then managing the day-to-day -day operations to make that happen. I love that, that synthesis that you just put together. Thank you. Anyone else want to share verbally? Well, I think the other real distinction about church uh, administration versus like uh, in a corporate setting, we have to be good leaders because we're working with volunteers. Even if they're, you know, the various ministry leaders who 
we're supporting their ministry, which supposedly is their vision, but we have got to be a good leader to help motivate, encourage, support, serve, come under them, and uh, lead the way while we're helping along the way. Uh, so it's it's certainly more challenging that, hey, this is where we're going, and, and because I'm your boss, this is what we're going to do next. Yeah, thank you for that, Tim. And I wanted to, you made me want to go back to uh, the second bullet because you with volunteers, oh my goodness, um, I had the the blessed opportunity. Um, you all may be familiar with Zion Church. I was there for several years and I was over the, the volunteers. I had the opportunity to grow our volunteer base from like 200 and some when I started to uh, about 500 and some, but, but just the challenge of helping volunteer leaders as well as volunteer team members um, move in the direction, not just, as Tim said, what they envision for their ministry, that the ministry wherein they serve, but how it fits into the larger body of the church. Just to know that that's your area of shepherding <laughs> makes it a wonderful challenge. So you're not just managing and helping folks achieve objectives, but you're helping them buy into the larger vision as well. Very helpful. Any other thoughts? I just, I was going to agree with all of this and say that I, I think it's John Maxwell, one of the leadership guys who says that, uh, you know, leadership in the church is one of the purest forms of leadership because you don't have the leverage of, <laughs> you know, salary or bosses, that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I'd echo that. Um, and then I just forgot the other thing. So yeah, <laughs> I yeah. agree. No, that's good. That's good. I mean, to, <laughs> you it may feel good and sound good that you have all of these paid employees and you know you work for this five, Fortune 500 company, but come over here and, <laughs> and lead yeah. these volunteers right. Right. <laughs> successfully. That's a, that's a feat. Nikki, I saw you unmute. And then Helen. Okay, so the only thing that I was going to add, I, I agree with what everybody else said, but for me, I do a lot of work with kids, so I'm also looking at, you know, leading and managing the kids, but what are they seeing? Because, you know, we're raising future leaders and managers of the church and other areas of the world, and it's just like, that's important to me about what are we demonstrating for them. Oh, that's so good. We're going to come back to that. Well, the, the 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 thoughts that I'm going to share as we move forward will bring us back to what's really important about what we do um, and how that, to your point, can affect those that we are serving um, and those who are watching, right? Who are who we are influencing. Thank you for that. And then Helen, um, agreeing with everything that has been said. What I've noticed is. A lot of people that are volunteers bring their work habits to the church, mm. not understanding or not being clear on the fact that in the church, we are servants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And while they may have a skill set that is secular, mm -hmm. that skill set may not be conducive to the church environment if we are mm -hmm. to be servants. Mm. You're going. You're you're tapping into my presentation, which I love because we're we're on the same page. Um, and to be very honest with you, Helen, I I even take that a step further. I think that there is something the corporate setting should understand about how we serve in exactly. um, in religious spiritual settings. And so, um, my le this presentation that literally we're we're doing going over today. I don't change it. Um, you'll notice that it doesn't have scriptures in it. I, you know, I have my MDiv. I study the word. I could do that. But what I believe about leadership crosses all sectors. Um, and, and we're going to be able to see that, that I believe that there are some lessons that we've learned about servant leadership that, um, that many corporations and um, CEOs of, of companies could learn from us. So I agree with you about how um, that can be mistaken, bringing some skills that are that are less than servanthood I love that right because as a as a ordained minister myself um and being retired federal at a headquarters level mm -hmm. you know headquarter people we we sort of can be a little different particularly when you have <laughs> other smaller uh, entities under you mm -hmm. so we're on the policy side 
And that was one thing I had I had to really adjust to because I can I can navigate between the two. Mm-hmm. But in the secular world, you know, someone gets on your nerve, you know, I've had SESers that will all of a sudden they transfer to Alaska. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, whereas you can't be that um pointed in 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 a religious or a, a Christian environment, mm-hmm. we need to learn how to to persuade, influence, motivate, you know, all of the leadership. Mm-hmm. Because I totally agree with Kenneth when he says we have to wear both hats. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We yeah. just do. You know? So true. So true. Thank all you. Right. I'm 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 gonna mute myself so I can stop talking. No, you're great. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Um, I don't think I'm doing my job if I don't get us uh, generating some conversation. So uh, you're helping me here. I appreciate it. So I think we are on the same page about the best leaders being good managers and the best managers being good leaders. And I think based on this conversation we just had, just to get started, I agree, Erin. Great discussion um, to get started. You're going to see my leadership um, slant, (laughs) my leadership bent as we move forward. It is not hierarchical um, and, you know, it is not kind of military style, autocratic and all of those things. It really is more servant leadership, value-based leadership. Um, And so that's what's going to come out. And it, it sounds like we're all on the same page about that. I really do want to start with kind of um, where the origin of this conversation starts. And I, I, I could go a lot of places with this, like I said, but it, I'm going to do it a bit um, unconventional in that we're, we're not going to talk about theories and origins of leadership studies and all of those things. In order to talk about being a good leader or a good manager, I really just want to start with the fact um, that we need to talk about in general what a leader is. And all of this will be um, unconventional, so go with me. I believe that a leader is simple. I don't I don't need a whole bunch of difficult definitions. Um, I believe that a leader, and remember, I'm not gonna do a, a whole lot of work now from here on out between leader and manager, because we really just wanna figure out how to do this work of influencing others better, right? We know that we're working toward vision that's set. We know we're working toward objectives. We, as the leaders of our area, we are working to help people want to, to be motivated to move toward that, especially as volunteers. So I'm going to use this word leader as all encompassing and just say that a leader is one who influences others. Um, If you are able to empower, motivate, influence others towards something, then you are a leader. That can be done positively or negatively. Like there, you know, <laughs> we can really just go all the way left and say Hitler was a leader, right? Just take it all the way over there. And so leadership can be positive or negative. And there are good leaders and there are bad leaders. And I'm sure we have all experienced um, both and some spectrum in between on the spectrum in between. Um, But we're going to focus on effective leadership, what it means to be the best leader that we could possibly be. And I am going to introduce the idea of soul because I mentioned to you the framework that I've put together is called leading with soul. And so if you'll give me just a moment, this is again my origins and it'll lead us to these practical takeaways that I want us to have. But I believe that our soul, of course, if we make the distinctions of, you know, our our tri being the way that that God is triune, um, that our triune being, our soul represents who we really are, our essence, the the part of us that houses our personality, our likes, our dislikes, our dreams, our ideas, our intuition, our heart, or our mind. The body, uh, the Bible references. I believe that that represents soul. I don't believe that that is supposed to be discounted. I believe that, of course, it is supposed to be under subjection of the Holy Spirit, but I don't believe that it's supposed to be discounted. In fact, I believe that connecting our, who we really are, the essence of who we really are with our leadership makes us better. 
And so I call it a leader with soul, one who influences, because remember, that's what a leader is, being while being exactly who they are at their core, at their best. Now, if I'm being exactly who I am all the time, I can be honest with you, I'm not being my best all the time, right? But, but if I make the distinction that effective leadership is when I am being who I am at my core, at my best, I believe that's being a leader with soul. Because what that means to me is that I'm not necessarily trying to be like any other leader. I'm not trying to lead like Tim. I'm not trying to lead like Aaron or Helen. I am being my own um, di distinct version of my best self as a leader. And so what that does is it not only brings about uniqueness and creativity, but it also brings about a level of authenticity that people will be willing, see the connections that I'm making, people will be willing to want to follow. They will be willing to want to be influenced by because they see your level of authenticity. And so um, I believe that a leader with soul is someone, again, who influences others while being exactly who they are at their core, at their best, while influencing others from a place, because this is what I believe it means to be your best, influencing at a place of authenticity, vulnerability, and empathy. And I'm going to share with you some practical takeaways from this in just a moment, but I want you to consider your leadership style, who you are as a manager slash leader, and if you can say that you influence from a place of authenticity, vulnerability, and empathy. Let me give you some, some meat behind that if I can, and then I'll get your take on it before I give you these practical takeaways. Authenticity for me is an honest, real place. It's about location. It's about where I'm coming from. As I'm leading you, where am I coming from? Am I coming from a place of envy or jealousy or arrogance? Am I coming, what is my origin for this um, moment of leadership, for this season of leadership that I'm in, for this position that I've been given? What, what am I trying to accomplish here? Am I trying to show me or am I trying to um, better and, and extend the vision of the church or the organization? What honest, real place am I coming from and do I exhibit that? Um, when I talk, when I respond, when I act, when I make decisions as I'm living things out. And so um, this person who, who leads from a place of authenticity takes an, an ability to, they have an ability to self-assess and take constructive criticism from those that we trust. And so we are okay with being ourselves at our best, at our core. And also it comes from an honest place. So we're, we're looking for feedback. We're always self-reflecting and we're always looking from trusted places um, feedback. Secondly, vulnerability. Vulnerability, leading with vulnerability is transparency in our words and our deeds. It's about how we communicate. It's about communication. How do we communicate the vision? So now I'm coming from the right place, but am I transparent with my words and my deeds? Does it, do I, I if you've ever been in, in an organization or in a space and work with people where it looks like they, you know, they have their right hand all, all the time, but you don't know what that left hand is doing. They under communicate, decisions are made, they don't give you the whys behind them. And, and you can't always tell the whys, but you can be honest about the fact that I can't tell you the why, but this is what we've decided. Like literally the vulnerability and transparency in communication is so important to influence and motivate. We can just do the work and encourage people to do the work, or we can lead them by influencing them and motivating them and empowering them. So a person that leads for, with vulnerability takes a willingness um, to, to, to take risks and be exposed and share openly to over-communicate rather than just saying, okay, we're all here to do a job, just do it. No, let me talk about um, maybe what I have experienced um, in this position or the position that you're now in that I was in. Let me talk about when this didn't work and why we're doing it this way and the reason why I think that's important for us. Let me talk about the obstacles, what we're going to face as we move forward. I'm hoping that this resonates with you. I've got one more and then I want your feedback on all three of these um, before we move into the last part. 
So empathy, em leading with empathy is um, having compassion for those you influence. And you would like to believe <laughs> that I would not have to say this to church leaders and I'm probably preaching to the choir, but I know, you know, some leaders in churches that are not empathetic who are not compassionate for those that they lead, for those that they influence. And so this is really about active love. It's about active um, sympathy. <laughs> it's about compassion. Do you think about those you influence? Do you think about those team members and, and not about how annoying they are or how, um, how di difficult they are, but, but what is behind that? Help I, God help me understand them and help me do things that would, um, that would nurture them and grow them in a way that they feel like we're moving, not just the church, but them as individuals. Um, in general, do we focus our time, energy, and efforts on others outside of ourselves? So we have a job to do, and these people are here to help us do this job. Is that the extent of it? Is it about us and our job, or is it also about these folks and their growth in the process? Do we make efforts to understand others? And so the place of empathy that we're talking about takes a sacrifice of spending time, energy, attention, focus, thought process, resources on others. I'm asking now, I guess, does this resonate with you? Let me go back to this part. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, it really uh, struck a chord with me. I, I remember early on when I was the administrator, I was always having to rally groups of people to do things around the building. I, I'm, re, I'm in a small church and I'm responsible for everything. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was always having to, to get people to work. And at one point the Lord really caught me up and said, you know, um, you need to uh, do a better job of focusing on building people mm. uh, and in the process of accomplishing your task rather than um, finishing a task and ignoring the people who you're working with. Mm. That, that that is in a church setting, it's so important, those relationships and the encouragement and the support. And I was just, I got a work day coming up on Saturday and I looked down the list of the guys who committed to come and help me. And there are all guys I'm in a Bible study with mm -hmm. and I have personal relationship with. All of the other guys that, over the years that I've had relationship with, they aren't coming. Mm -hmm. But it's the guys who I'm currently connected to. Mm -hmm. They're all coming to help me. Mm -hmm. And I, boy, that really resonated with me. <laughs> oh, my. Th thank you for sharing that, Tim. It's the fact that you are um, mutually vested in each other's growth in that Bible study that has created such a strong connection that extends beyond that Bible study. And when they see you put a call out, they are they are there. I love that example. So, so true. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Anyone else? No pressure, just checking in. I was I was going to say on that. I mean, similar to that. I think Tim, I, I was reading a stewardship book, and but I think it resonates here. He had the, I think it was Love at Weems. He, yeah, he had this phrase about stewardship, but I think it's about relationship here too. It's that we don't use people to get the work done. We use the work to get people done. Exactly. You know, and, and I think that's, that's it. particularly true in the church, right? Exactly. So this this idea on vulnerability too, and you didn't quite say it, but I think one of the areas, and it's, and it's very difficult for me, is being vulnerable is being having a willingness to be questioned, which means a willingness to possibly be wrong, right? And <laughs> and to be wrong in front of other people, mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's hard, <laughs> you know. And and that's where I know I struggle, and I know our leadership struggles too. It's just how do you how do you do that? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's so important. Um, before Kenneth speaks, you just made me think about it's such an important muscle to uh, example in front of people, because if we do want church to be a place of healing, we really can't heal from what we don't reveal. And it doesn't mean that we reveal it to everyone, um, but we have to have safe place safe space to be vulnerable and to be transparent and to be have the freedom to be wrong and to be you know lovingly corrected constructive 
crit criticism or feedback. And um, to be a leader and example that, it's the hardest because you are the leader, but it's the most important because you are the leader. So that's so good. Thank you for that. Thanks, yeah. Kenneth. Well, yes, what I was gonna add is that it, it is kind of a delicate balance as you move forward with it, because many times you do have to guide and, and you know, kind of make the final call, if you will. But um, many times what I try to do is have the stakeholders to have influence or have suggestions, if you will, in talking it through mm -hmm. while all the time, at the same time, guiding, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that, that applies to the volunteers, that imply, applies to those who are employed, um, you know, may not be making the highest salary, of course. I mean, they, you know, no one ever thought about necessarily working in a church unless you felt that you had a calling early on in life. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as far as those who even compensated, you know, you always ask them to go above and beyond what their, you know, position description actually states. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always, you know, those having, again, a stake in the final call, um, mm -hmm. but while guiding. Mm -hmm. I love that balance because what you're saying is I, I, I know my job, but I have to shepherd um, delicately and um, informing along the way and keeping them sort of at pace with me instead of just moving ahead of them and saying, go this way. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's correct. That's really good. Really yeah. good. At least I try. I yeah, know. right. <laughs> I am all the time. Just that. <laughs> doing, doing our level best. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Tim, did you have another thought? Are you good? Okay, I think you're good. All right, so feel free to jump in at any time, anybody. I, I wanna give you that freedom to do that. We're, we're really gonna talk about um, the, the community again that I mentioned to you. We talk about these um, seven pillars um, to get to the crux of what uh, what we just discussed, that authenticity, vulnerability, and empathy, we, we really hone in on these principles and talk about literally leading from the inside out. And so I've had the, the great pleasure for the last few years of mentoring women leaders. And we this is our framework that we use as it relates to how we guide ourselves through this journey of leadership. And so starting with char uh, character and moving in courage, um, understanding the culture in which we are in and we're leading and how to shift culture and affect culture, um, having compassion for others, um, and then developing our content and our creativity, uh, as well as our levels of communication, becoming more effective communicators. And I mentioned this because um, when we get to the point where we feel like, you know, we have perfected all of this, I think, you know, uh, <laughs> we'll be looking at some glory gates or something, but there's always the opportunity to hone in on these skills as leaders. And so I just challenge you to, to look at these power statements to say, can I confidently say that, you know, I'm clear on my personal values because my personal values affect my leadership. Can I clearly say I'm willing to take risks because in order for me to be the best leader or the best manager, we may have to do things the way they've never been done before. Um, can I set and assess the culture of my group when I have dissenters and when I have um, folks that aren't in line with the pastor's vision or with the objectives that we've laid out? And can I be a culture shifter? Um, can I prioritize compassion in all of my interactions? We all just said, you know, we're works in progress with that, but that's our, our goal. Can I produce quality content um, that allows people to learn and grow and not just be about the work, but they learn and grow while they're doing the work? Um, can I, am I uniquely creative? Is that about soul work? Am I being me in the process and not just mimicking and doing what I've seen done? And then can I communicate when, can I connect when I communicate? Um, and just knowing that effective communication is really all about effective connection. Um, and, and so these are things that we dig into a lot. I am going to um, really hone in on you for the rest of this time. 
And I'm hopeful this is being recorded. So I'm hopeful that it gets shared beyond those of us who are on the live right now. I'm hopeful that you share it beyond even the folks that are here. I am, you know, always welcome to um, invite. I am open to coming to any invitation where I'm welcome to come and talk about it in more depth. But what we're going to do is just take a little bit of time for the rest of this time to focus on you. So you're going to get the opportunity to practice some vulnerability, <laughs> some authenticity, um, and really just hone in on your levels of authenticity, vulnerability, and empathy. Um, because I believe it's important to know yourself, to know thyself. Because knowing ourselves is the beginning of all wisdom. And I believe we are our best leaders. We are our best managers uh, when we practice honesty and transparency and vulnerability um, that Mother Teresa said, honesty and transparency make you vulnerable. Be honest and transparent anyway. <laughs> I love that quote. Um, and the better we know ourselves, the better our relationship is with our team members, with our volunteer leaders, with our pastor, with our community, with our world. And so what I'm going to do is just give you a few practical check-ins um, as it relates to being a better leader, a better manager. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to rate yourself on them. And you can choose to just self-reflect and within yourself. But I'm also going to give you a chance to put it in the chat and maybe even converse about it if you so like. So we'll see how, I'll show you how the first one goes. Oh, I, I forgot about this one. Oh, no, no, this is the first one. Okay. Um, so this is um, this is what makes a good leader, very practical things that we can remember about what makes a good leader, right? So uh, your first opportunity to kind of self-evaluate. Again, this is all about you as an individual, not about anybody else. I know the difference between confidence and conceit. I want you to think about that for a minute. I know the difference between confidence and conceit. This quote I love, it says, arrogance is thinking you are above someone else and confidence is knowing no one is above you. And so I think especially in church circles, we are seen as more arrogant or conceited if we are confident in our leadership, if we are confident as managers. And I believe there's a distinct difference that we don't think we are above others. We just know God has given us this opportunity to lead and serve. And so we, we can, and I, believe me, you can be confident and have fear exist. <laughs> You can, you know, I'm not sure if this is going to work. I don't know what they're going to think about me, but I'm going to confidently move forward in the decision that's made, knowing that I am willing to be vulnerable and admit mistakes later, but I'm clear about the difference. I'm not being conceited. I'm not being arrogant. I'm not being egotistical. And, you know, that can be a wonderfully thin line <laughs> for leaders, right? Because you got to have confidence in yourself, even when others don't. Um, while at the same time knowing that no one is above you. You're simply a member of the body doing your part so that others can do their part. I'm wondering if um, one of the ways I suggest that we do this very practically is to keep people around us who encourage us and challenge us. So encourage us to say, yes, you got it. You can do it. That might be a spouse. It might be a family member. It might be a, 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 a colleague um, in the office. It might be a friend that you keep up to date on how things are going with you. But those same people have to also have the opportunity and the freedom to challenge you. Um, I, you know, I, I love saying, you know, I am... I am not Dr. So-and-so when I get in the house. <laughs> that is not who I, I am mama and I am wife, right? I'm not Dr. So-and-so. And so to really keep me confident um, and, and not conceited, <laughs> I am encouraged by my family and I'm also challenged in a loving way by my family. So I'm wondering for you as a leader, you have the opportunity and now you're gonna see how the rest of these are gonna go. I'll be able to flow a little faster with these. I want you to put in the chat for me, if you don't mind, how you would rate yourself on knowing the difference, feeling really good about confidence um, and not really struggling. Do you, do you struggle with the idea 
that I have to move forward confidently for fear of, of the church or you know the, the religious belief that I would be walking out of conceit or arrogance. Do you practice confidence consistently? Do you need to practice confidence more or have you not begun practicing confidence just yet? You can put in the chat a one, a two or a three. And then I'd love for you to share anything you'd like to unmute and share or not. I'll look at the, yeah, okay, I got them coming in. I've got a practice consistently. That's beautiful. I've got a, I need to practice this one more. I hear you, Aaron. I could walk in my confidence just a bit more knowing that I'm not being conceited about it. Helen said, I walk in it consistently. You all are practicing vulnerability, just sharing. So I appreciate it. Anybody else want to share in the chat or unmute? Totally up to you. Thank you, Kenneth. Okay. Keep them coming or just soak them in, right? <laughs> I know that it may take more than a minute to think about it. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. Even if it takes more than just a minute to think about it, you'll get the slides and you'll get the recording to really think about it. Self-reflection is really important. So I only have about maybe five more of these. Um, so I don't know if that's going to end up giving us minutes back. I think we're till 2.30. Let me know if we're not because I can I can round this out really quickly if we're until two. Yes, um, two, 2 p.m. Oh, 2 p.m., 2 p.m., yeah. got it. Okay, yes. so I got it. Yeah. I can and, round and, it and out. I, actually, if, if I may take the liberty, Brother President, I would say maybe 158 because we have to handle a few other business matters. Got it. Sounds good, yes. Got it, got it. This will be good, good, good. Okay, so let's do this. Let's say... Um, that this next one is acknowledging that the leader does not have all the answers, right? How, how much pressure do we feel to have all the answers? Um, how does that feel for us to really practice in, in real life? Surround ourselves with people smarter than us. So if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat, do you surround yourself with people you feel like are smarter than you? And sometimes it's a volunteer issue, right? I want to, but I don't have the wherewithal to do it as much as I'd like. And I'll keep the, the ratings going um, and just get feedback from you in the last few minutes. Um, but if, if you wouldn't mind sharing, let's see. Do you have people around you sort of who, yeah, okay, we can practice this one more, Helen says. Lots of smart people around, Aaron says. Awesome, awesome. You do not have to be the one that has all the answers. And I know that might feel like a lot of pressure sometimes, but, um, but yeah, just knowing that, um, and, and if you're like me, I sometimes think, you know, it won't be done right unless it's done by me or if, um, unless it, the decision is thought through by me. But this challenges us to, to allow, Nikki said it, encourage other people to step up. Yeah, this is a good group, right? I love it. Kenneth, go for it. No, I was just going to say that, again, that kind of goes to the teamwork, you know, approach that I try to have, because as, as I, real quick here, with staff, as we go forward and do various things, and we all have a part in it, um, I, I say that, you know, from, if somebody says that, hey, you did a really good job, I'm like, thank you, because of the team effort. Yeah. But then if somebody says things could be improved, or things did not go as planned, I say, wow, the team really has to do a better job. <laughs> You know, because I love that. Me, I love right. that. Exactly. So it's really a team approach. Yeah, that's good. Right. Because the flip side is you could take all of the onus of responsibility of things going wrong on your shoulders too. But if we're in it all as a team, we're going to learn together and grow together right. as a team too. That's good. That's, that's right. good. good, good, I, think, good. Um, I think role models are so important for this too. I, I think about my first real boss and he just modeled this so well, you know, not a man of faith at all, but just modeled the real humility and you know, I then learned how to be, a le I mean, he was super bright, you know, <laughs> he, he knew a lot, but he didn't come across that way. And he was always soliciting feedback and, uh, and, and, you know, getting the whole group uh, wisdom. So, you know, now I think about, you know, I'm approaching that age that he was when I started and wow, I, I might be in those shoes. <laughs> I might be a role model for somebody else. And that's, that's so a little good. humbling too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it humbles you. And it's great that you have you have had that example. Some people teach us what to do, some people teach us what not to do, right? So, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. 
This next one is understanding the importance of empowering others to lead. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna whiz past this one a little bit because it sounds like we're kind of on the same page about this one that we as good leaders know we have to develop leaders, um, that the function of leadership is to produce more leaders, not more followers. And so um, to delegate and celebrate others, um, it's, you know, it's not always easy because you're always looking for volunteers to help with the work. Um, but once we get them and once they are willing and once we've pulled them in, we've really got to give them opportunities to do the work and celebrate them when they do. Um, and so you can, you're welcome to put it in the chat. I think I've seen a little bit of this um, in some of what we've said already. Do we delegate? Do we celebrate? Do we give people the opportunity to lead? Um, I think that's co connected to the one we shared. But if you have a one, a two, or a three to share in there, please feel free to do so. Yes, Nikki, <laughs> give them an opportunity to step up, right? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. I'll, I'll allow you to continue to mull over this one. I want to honor your time. I have about three more, I think. This one is seeking progress and growth, not perfection. And I don't know if there are any, hi, my name is Trinace and I'm a recovering perfectionist. I don't know if there are any recovering perfectionists in the group with me. Brene Brown's uh, book, The Gift of Imperfections is really helpful to me related to this. Um, thank you, Tim, for answering that last one. And um, it's really important for us to know that it doesn't have to be perfect in order for it to be done. Um, and so uh, I use my dissertation as, as an example. It took me 10 years to do it. And so the best dissertation is a done one, in my opinion. Um, so embracing and discussing our imperfections openly, this gets back to, um, it was either Tim or Aaron who said it, that you know we have to be willing to talk about and get feedback and, and admit that we've made mistakes or that we are open to the fact that we make mistakes. So the question here is, are we are we willing to embrace imperfection? <laughs> That's a hard one for some of us. Yeah, Helen. I knew it. I knew I had a recoverer with me in here. I struggle with this one. Inheriting a seasoned staff can be difficult due to uh, yeah, leading or managing. Yeah, much persuasion. So the the delegating as well as being able to deal with imperfection, I think, is both. Um, Nikki said, I make notes how to do it better or different the next time. Really good. Really good. And I know I'm moving a little quick. I just want to make sure that I honor your time. So just know that these are ones you can consider later. I think there are two more. Setting clear expectations of team members for accountability later. This one is so important. Clear expectations, even for volunteers. We can't even judge whether it was done right or wrong if they don't have clear expectations, right? A clear vision. And so one model of this that comes from the Oz principle, if you haven't had a training on uh, individual and organizational accountability, I am welcome to come do it for you because it, it is a game changer. But uh, first you define the result, then you determine time to report on the progress, and then you deliver praise or coaching. This loop should be happening all the time, even with volunteers, as difficult as that might be, because it's just so important, um, so important to set clear expectations. So uh, check-ins and clear expectations. How would you rate yourself on this one? Give me your honest take on that. How would you rate yourself on setting clear expectations? And sometimes the work goes so fast. It's so much work, <laughs> right? That it's really hard to, um, to, to hone in on, you know, checking in or, or setting clear expectations. But I want you to give some thought to that. And I'm going to honor, I think this is the, the last one, if not the next to the last one, I'll go through this one fast, embracing a succession plan. And as difficult, thank you for that, Aaron, resistant to accountability, really difficult. We can, we can in another hour, invite me in another hour, and we can really dig into some of these, right? Um, but it gives you an opportunity to do some quick reflection on which ones are my pain points, which ones do I really need to focus on for myself 
or for our organization. And one of them might be a succession plan. Um, really finding and pouring into your replacement. This is not always easy to talk about. It's not always easy to do because we are in a volunteer environment, but having someone that you are nurturing and pouring into so that were anything to happen to you, not just the, the tragic stuff being hit by a bus, but were you to um, you know uh, win the lottery and decide to move to Florida, <laughs> if you're not in Florida, uh, if, if you don't already have a place in Florida, um, this is DC Metro. Um, just really thinking about who would do that for you. And so I want you to give some thought to that. Just succession planning, setting them is not the problem. It's resistance to change. Yeah, yeah, the resistance. It, so let's let's come back and talk about change management one day. <laughs> I would love that. I'm just seeing some themes popping up, Helen, and I'm I'm willing to come and explore those. And I do think this is the last one. And it's the most important, if you'll just give me 60 seconds to say, that uh, I know from personal experience that church leadership is the most difficult leadership of all leaderships. <laughs> because not only do you have to deal with the work of and the business of the organization, but you've got to deal with the spiritual aspect of it. And so it is all the more important that you play, that you rest, that you rejuvenate, the opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression, says Brene Brown. And you can agree or disagree, but how many of us have experienced ourselves or um, have experienced it in others, um, some church victorious Christians, our spirit is <laughs> going to glory, but it might get there quicker if we don't take better care of ourselves, right? So take regular breaks from your work to play and rest. Being a good leader and a good manager is doing that as well. And so without asking your, um, your take on those, I have given you, oh my goodness, probably a 30, 35 minute version of what uh, I would normally share in a couple of hours. And so um, based on all we learned and did to together, I'm hoping that there's at least one thing that you can take away for yourself or your team, your church, um, in a separate session, let me know if I can serve you in any way separately. And I believe I, I'm one minute late. <laughs> Get it on one minute off at no, 1.59. No, right on time. Right um, on time. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. Um, this is my contact information. Feel free to take a picture of it. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. Oh, thank you for, for being here. I was going to say you, you in one hour delivered probably about 10 hours worth of material or certainly 10 hours, you know, dozen hours behind there where you could, you could, I, and I, I feel like there's, there's a ton of stuff we could come back to. Um, so thank you. Really appreciate that. Any, any final things for Trinace? Again, I just want to personally thank her, you know, for sharing, um, as you see, well qualified, well, as I mentioned. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, so as I told you, I mean, she, she's, she's, she's dynamic. So thank you again, family. Yes. Thank you so much. Dr. From, Trinice, uh, yes. you put your contact information back up? My arm doesn't move that fast. I wanted to take a picture. <laughs> well, I am I am just pleased you're still here, Helen. We did our Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> still you. here and she's still coherent, yeah? yeah? Yeah, yeah. I'm barely, but this was some good stuff. This Thank was, you. This was tremendous stuff. Yeah, really. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. And so I'll just, I'll take that as an opportunity to, to say thank you formally on the slide. <laughs> and I look forward to hearing from any or all of you. Thank you again. You're welcome. Okay, give us a 30 seconds on what do you do for churches? What what services do you offer? Sure, no problem. So it does run the gamut and you'll be able to see that on the website. I'm a wonderful hodgepodge of, of gifting. Um, thanks be to God. So I'm a preacher. Um, I also sing, but in the, in the realm of consulting, I come to workshops, conferences, seminars, um, everything from team development, leadership development. Um, because I am an ordained minister, there isn't a biblical topic that I couldn't help us dig into in a practical way. And so you would really just have to tell me what your need is. And I, I stand in confidence and not conceit that I can help you meet those goals. 
That's awesome. Thank you. Well, right. we may we may be looking you up for our next staff development day. So. Would love that. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We won't keep you any longer. We'll we'll do our business here. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.